intro before you start. All right. Cool. Hey, welcome everyone. This is the first of the quarter. Um, my name is Nadia Kuzner. If you're new here, I'm the STEM Outreach Program Coordinator. A little bit about my background. I'm also an archaeologist and anthropologist, but I don't teach yet. I just love coordinating. <laughs> I'm here to introduce uh, Dr. Nick Maseas, but within STEM, we call him Nick. <laughs> He's our professor at Clark College. Are any of you students at STEM? Are you getting extra credit? Are you here for your credit? We're good. <laughs> well, I won't talk about his topic. Oh, he's out. Come in. Oh, no, he came by. <laughs> Just say hi. <laughs> he's got club meeting. Oh. Well, if you do have extra credit from any professors, there's a list there. You can just write your name and your instructor. <coughs> and if you want to be updated, I do have a Facebook page. It's at Clark STEM Seminars. So you can just follow that. And uh, But if you want a personal update, you can also put your email there. And also put whatever science there that you're interested in. It kind of gives me some feedback in recruiting uh, speakers, which I'm going to start doing for the winter and spring quarters. And get some desserts. TGIF, okay? Enjoy yourselves. All right. All right, thank you. All right, so um, so I'm recording this, um, and I'm going to post the recording on YouTube, but I'm also trying to live stream it, and I don't think it's working and saying the internet connection is unstable, but we'll see if it works or not. Anyway, um, so thank you for the introduction. Thank you for coming here today. Um, so my name's Nick, and what I want to talk about for the next about 50 minutes is um, the research that I've been doing the past few years. And this is research that actually started about three decades ago, mid 80s. Some colleagues and I were starting to look at some questions about what is a computer? What does it mean to say that this thing is a computer or this thing computes? And how can we possibly change that? How can we morph that into something that's somehow more powerful or more useful? And about two years ago, this research took a pretty severe turn in a different direction. And so the focus of my talk is going to be basically what that direction has been these past two years of work that I've been doing. Um, so I want to start with a very basic question. What is a computer? And when we think about a computer, right, we have certain images in our mind. But if we go back several decades, this is what a computer looked like. And these two programmers are actually kind of inside the computer because the computer filled the entire room. They were surrounded by all this equipment. And they're entering a program into the computer, but back then you didn't type a program in on a keyboard. The way you programmed a computer was by turning these knobs and moving these patch cables from one spot to another. You had to physically alter the structure of the hardware in order to load a program in. Software didn't exist at the time. Quick historical note, in the 50s, most of the programmers were women. Okay, go back 100 years, Charles Babbage, first programmable machine, who wrote the programs? Ada Lovelace, first programmer in history. So if you hear women don't belong in CS, women can't program, absolute lie. Okay, no basis in reality. So scoot forward about 70 years and go into Google and say computer and do an image search, and you get sort of the things that you're probably visualizing for a computer. These boxes, they have keyboards, they have displays, there's usually some kind of pointing system, a touch panel, a mouse, something like that. And some of these machines, you know, are very old. This is a much older one over here. Um, but they're all basically kind of look the same. And there's a reason for that, which is that the design of these machines is basically the same as the design of the machines from the 50s and 60s. The fundamental architecture hasn't changed. It's what's called the von Neumann architecture. Now, these machines are faster, they're cheaper, they're more reliable, but the basic design of what a computer is has been stable for several decades now. So what do we do with computers? We solve problems, right? We take a problem, we want to know the answer to it, we write a program, and the computer gives us the answer. So here's a pretty simple question that we can think about, which is why doesn't my mouse clicker flick? <laughs> All right, so what happens when a rock falls? So you take a rock, you hold it over the ground, you let it go, what's going to happen? Well, we know it's going to start to move down. It's going to move towards the center of the Earth. We may also realize that it's going to accelerate. It's going to go faster and faster. And we may also know that at some point, wind resistance will counteract that acceleration, and it will move at a steady speed after that. It will hit a terminal velocity. And so we can write mathematical equations that describe this behavior. So these things are called differential equations. So you know what algebra is probably. It relates quantities to one another. If you have a rectangle with a height and a width, what's the area? Okay. 
Calculus is just algebra, but your quantities are changing over time. The things that change are called differentials, and when you write equations relating differentials to one another, you get a diffy q, a differential equation like this. And diffy q's are basically the way that we can use mathematics to understand the world, right? To understand how different systems change. I don't know if that door is locked or this person is just bashful, but there's some bashful. people out there. <laughs> All right, there you go, thanks. So we can write these equations and they describe the behavior of this falling rock and we can put these equations into a computer and now we can ask questions. Where will this rock be after two seconds? How fast will it be moving? Or how long after I drop it will it hit the ground? The problem is these are approximations. These are based on simplifying assumptions. For example, the rock has to be a perfect sphere and the atmosphere has to be completely uniform. Same temperature, same humidity everywhere. Gravity up here has to be exactly the same as gravity here. These are all simplifications. And with those simplifications, our computer can give us an approximate answer. But to do an exact model of this falling rock is very difficult. And once the rock hits the ground, all bets are off, right? Which way is it going to roll? How far will it roll? Will part of it break off? We can't answer those questions. Our computers are just not powerful enough. Okay, we could come up with some, some more sophisticated diffy cues, but we basically can't answer those questions. Basic question, drop a rock, where does it end up? Can't answer that. Until today, because I have discovered a computer that can answer this question. And it'll answer it perfectly. You wanna see it? It's called the super duper special purpose rock computer. <laughs> you know, put these on Craigslist for 10 bucks each. <laughs> you put googly eyes on it. <laughs> okay, so this, this is a computer that will solve all of those equations exactly. <coughs> now to use this, you have to load in a program, and the program is you basically take it where you want it to fall and you hold it up at the initial height, and that loads the program in. <coughs> and when you want to run the program, this is tricky, right? You take your fingers and you move them away from each other, <laughs> and then the rock computer takes over. So you want to see it solve these equations in real time? Here we go. Dropping the rock, program starts to run, and there's your answer. That's where the rock will end up. <laughs> Ten bucks, could be yours. Okay. This is phenomenally powerful, right? This is not something we can do with a PC, but this super duper rock computer will do it. Okay, well that's great for analyzing falling rocks, but how far does that get us? Let's look at a more complex system. Let's look at ocean waves. So you go to seaside and you're hanging out at the beach and you're watching the water coming in. All right, I gotta go with my mouse because things aren't cooperating. So you're hanging out on the beach, you're watching the waves come in, right? And they build up and they get close to the shore and they break and it's pretty to watch and it makes a cool sound. And this is an area called fluid dynamics. And here are some of the equations in fluid dynamics that describe the behavior of waves acting this way. But, but this is just a few of the equations and these are also overly simplified. Right? To actually run the equations to predict where a wave is going to break and how tall it's going to be, can't even imagine doing that okay, with today's systems. Just way too complex. And the system is chaotic. Right? If a fish in Tokyo Bay flaps its fin to the left instead of the right, two days later, this wave breaks in a totally different way. Okay? So phenomenally difficult problem to solve, except if you use my ocean wave computer. <laughs> And this system will solve those equations and give you the exact answer to every question that you want to ask. You want to know where this particle of water is in 10 seconds? Just wait 10 seconds and wherever it is, that's the answer. Okay, so you see what I'm doing here, right? You get the trend, okay? What you're probably wondering though is how far am I going to take this? So how far can we go? Can we make an Earth computer? that solves all the equations describing the Earth? Absolutely. I can tell you where to find one, just look down. <laughs> all right, and this is, this is doing a phenomenal amount of computation. It's solving all these equations simultaneously, very efficiently. Okay, so what's the limit point of this train of thought? Think Buzz Lightyear. So here's a section of the universe. This is the Hubble Deep Field. It's one of our deepest views of the universe. Every one of these little tiny dots of light is a galaxy. Right? These things look like galaxies, but every point of light on here is a galaxy. A huge number of falling rocks in here. Hopefully a huge number of shores of waves breaking on them. 
So I'm going to make the following claim without proof. The universe is just a giant computer that continually solves every equation describing anything. Okay, so as a good friend of mine likes to say sometimes, oh dear, so what's going on here, right? Where is all of this leading? Why are we doing this? Why is this happening to us? We probably came in for some snacks or just to see what was going on and now we're talking like crazy stuff, right? <laughs> so what's, what's the deal here? Why, why am I doing this? Um, this exercise. Well, here's the idea. If the universe is a computer that is somehow more capable than our computers today, what can we learn from it? Is there some way we can modify our computers today, our PCs, our <coughs> smartphones, and make them do things that this universe computer does? So I want to make a table and I want to go side by side and compare a computer to the universe. Right? Reasonable thing to do. So the first thing I'm going to note about a computer is that computers are based on what we call a dualism. Okay. Dualisms are this idea that subject and object are different from each other. That self and other are separate. Okay. In Freudian terms, it's the ego. It's this idea that there is something that causes an action and there's a recipient of the action. In a computer, this dualism takes the form of instructions and data. There's an instruction which says, add these two numbers together. And there's two numbers somewhere in memory and they get added together. And the instruction is causing that action to occur, and the data is just having this action applied to it. And the, in, the data never comes back and says, you know, I think you should be a subtract instruction instead of an add, right? It's a very one directional interaction. So it's a dualism. The universe does not suffer, suffer from this illusion. The universe is non dualistic, at least as far as, as many people believe. Um, from the view of the universe, there is no separation between self and other. There is no I, there is no ego. Okay, we can go into a whole talk on that, but let me give you a simple experiment to try. Take your hand and hit the table. Okay, now it's pretty clear what was going on here. This was the thing causing an action, hitting, and the table was the thing that was hit, right? That's a nice dualism. It's an illusion. How do I know that? Because if you hit the table really hard, what happens? Your hand hurts. Why does your hand hurt? Because at the very moment that you hit the table, the table hit your hand. The table was taking an action, and your hand was the recipient of that action. So it's not a one directional thing. I'm taking an action on the table. The table's also taking an action on me. Newton taught us this 400 years ago, right? People want opposite reaction. And you can't get away from it, as far as, as we know, right? There's no inherent separation between subjects and objects. So the universe is non-dual. So that's one big difference between computers. And this was the starting point in 1986 for something that was called the pig and was later called the cell matrix. And that was the start of this research, was trying to build a computer system that got rid of this dualism. Okay, you can see a cell matrix in the window of my office if you like. Um, next observation, in a computer, effects are very specific in their location. So if these are memory locations, and we have an instruction that says store a number at this location, that's the only location that's changed. Nearby locations, unaffected. That's deliberate. We work very hard to make that happen. In the universe, not so much. Very hard to imagine an action occurring at some point that only affects that point and doesn't affect anything nearby. All right, think about it. So I use the word karma. I don't mean karma in the sense of if you step on a bug, a large bug will come to your house and step on you. Okay? I mean karma in the following sense. If you apply an action to some point, you'll affect not only that point, but things nearby. And those nearby changes will affect things that are nearby them. And eventually, everything in the system is affected. And since you're a part of the system, you're affected. So your effects are distributed throughout the entire system, including back on yourself. And that's, that's the version of karma that we'll be talking about more in a few minutes. So effects are spread out. Um, in a computer, space is discretized. Instructions are stored at locations 0, 1, 2, 3, and there's nothing in between, right? <coughs> the universe, space seems to be continuous. Now, quantum effects, who knows? But for most of our, our view of the universe, space flows continuously. You can pick any two points, and there's a point in between them. So that's different. And the same with time. In a computer, time is discretized. There's a clock. You have a three gigahertz machine, three billion times a second, a clock ticks. And it's when that tick occurs that everything happens. And in between the ticks, nothing much is going on. Things are preparing for the next tick. 
but the state of the system doesn't change until the next tick. In the universe, time seems to flow continuously. You can pick two points in time, and there's always a point in between. So these are the four dimensions along which I began thinking. Um, our computers aren't very much like the universe. And so the idea was, could we somehow morph the design of the computer to take these aspects and make them look more like those aspects? So this is two years ago. This was a morning 10K run in the rain um, and decided to explore this. So let's, let's summarize the goals. We want the system to be egoless, okay? No dualisms. We want effects to be extended, that's karma. And we want continuity in space and time, okay? So the system is called EXIST, and it's just an acronym from some of those letters. So egoless, extended effect, continuous space time. And this design of computers is not startling, okay? Who designed computers? People. <coughs> And all of this reflects how we see the world. We see these dualisms. We believe we can take an action and it only affects the thing that we intended that action to affect, right? We're constantly chopping up space into little components. This is my room, this is my table, this is my country, this is my planet. And we continually chop up time into little units. How many minutes till class is over? How many weeks till the quarter ends? How many years till I can retire? Right? We're not comfortable with the idea of we're going to eat later. I want to know what time, how many seconds, minutes. Right? We see time as this collection of little events one after the other. So, so this you know, is not bad. It's just it's what we came up with because I think this is how we sort of see the world. And the universe is sort of free from those kinds of biases. All right, so a system is called exist. So how do we make a model for this? Right. Um, and the idea I had was basically, we can think of computers as just big transfer systems. Computers move things from one place to another. They might be moving a number from one location to another location, or they might be moving two numbers to the input of an adder, and then taking the output of the adder and moving that somewhere else. That's how you add two numbers in a computer. But they just move things around, right? But because space is discretized, we basically address these things with whole numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What if we address those things with real numbers? 2.5, 3.14, 2.718. What if you use those as a way to address the things in our computer's memory? Okay, so we've got real numbers. So that's, that's moving towards continuity in space. And let's have those transfers not just be point to point. When I want to move this number over here, I'm also going to move some stuff nearby to some location nearby. So I'm going to start blurring these effects. I'm going to start introducing this karma notion. And I'm going to get rid of the clock. Everything's going to be asynchronous. Okay? And asynchronous computing is a thing, but it's a very hard thing. It's a thing that gets popular every now and then, and then people decide it's too hard. But we'll get rid of the clock. Everything's going to happen all at the same time. And each piece of data is going to somehow represent an instruction. If I'm saying I want to add these two numbers together, Something else in the system is taking this number and saying, well, what does that number want me to do? It's going to be a piece of instruction. And that's going to be true for every piece of data. So this is going to end up with basically a system where everything is an instruction, and it's acting on everything all the time. OK, this is a huge mess. <laughs> this is just layers upon layers of, of complexity. But this is the idea, right? Build a system like this. So here's the model that, that I came up with. Imagine a sponge, okay? So there's a sponge sitting over here, and there's some liquid, and the liquid is you know, filling up different areas of the sponge, and this line tells you how much liquid there is at any <coughs> distance x from the left side, and y is just the height of the liquid. So we can basically store something like a function. We can go over some distance x and say, what's the value stored there? And it's just how much liquid we have at that location, and it can vary as you move along. OK, so we have a pair of chemicals, and I call them source and destination. And let's just look at some random location, 24.5. And let's suppose the amount of source chemical there, the height of the liquid in the sponge, is 2.1. And maybe in a separate sponge, or maybe in the same sponge, we have another chemical called destination. And the amount of that chemical is 1.7. We're going to take that as an instruction. 
which says I want to transfer some chemicals from location 2.1 right here to location 1.7 right here. And because this is what these chemical levels are here, there's going to be a little bit of transfer of chemicals from 2.1 to 1.7. But this is happening everywhere. Every location is an instruction asking that stuff gets transferred. All right, we have to discretize to run this on a PC because PCs don't understand continuity. So we break our space into these really tiny spatial regions called delta x, and we break time into these tiny time regions called delta t, and we approximate this. Eventually we don't. Eventually we won't build one of these things. But to simulate this on a PC, we've got to discretize. So we can think of this as a bunch of little tiny test tubes, each filled with a certain amount of source and destination. And each test tube is specifying a transfer. So here, for example, suppose we look at tube 5. It's got two units of source, 10 units of desk. That's an instruction. It says transfer some chemicals from 2 to 10. And a moment later, the amount of chemicals that took location 2 will be a little smaller, and in location 10, a little bigger. But remember, every single location has chemicals, and it's an instruction. And these things are instructions. This used to be an instruction which said transfer from 4 to 12. Now it says transfer from 4.08 to 12.09. And all this is happening at the same time. That's the basic model. And once we have a model, we can write a simulator. So here's a view of what's going on. Your chemicals are you know, situated horizontally. That's your x-axis. And each of these is one of these tubes filled with source, red, and destination chemicals. And it's doing something. I don't know what it's doing, though. But these chemical levels are changing. There seem to be these peaks over here. And the peaks go up and down a little bit, but they're still peaks. And so you just kind of sit here and stare at this for a while. And I did this for about a month with some friends. And we stared at it and we wondered what the heck was going on. OK, and now you're done staring at it. And it's like, OK, well, let's do some useful work with this. Let's write a program. Let's figure out how to load chemicals in here to do something useful. So how do we program this machine? I got no idea. <laughs> Absolutely no idea. I tried. I came up with the beginnings of some languages. And I could write very, very simple programs. But nothing that would actually approach <laughs> doing useful work. It's just it's crazy complex. It's so different from what we normally do um, that I didn't really have much hope of getting very far on this. So we switched gears. And we take more of a biologist approach. And we say, well, instead of trying to just go in and modify this thing, let's observe it. Let's put it under a microscope. Let's poke and probe and see what it does and see if we can figure out its behavior. And then maybe we can come in and we can start modifying that behavior. So we add some things to the simulation. So we have different ways of viewing what's happening with the chemicals. So here's the view that we just saw. The tubes are thin enough that they just look solid. But this is at any point in time showing the amount of source and destination at different points. This is kind of a sideways oscilloscope. So time is going down here. And I'm color coding the amount of red and blue into a combination, which is mostly purple. And the intensity shows how much red and blue there is. And this is just another way to look at it. And you can see patterns across time more easily with this view. So we stare at that for a few weeks, right? And look at the patterns and, and wonder what's going on. And then we start adding some knob settings. So karma, which is the degree to which transfers are spread out, we made that variable. So there's a slider here that we can use to adjust karma. So karma is 3.7 right now. That's pretty nominal. And there's stuff happening in here, right? There's chemicals moving around. We start increasing the karma. We bring it up to 13. We'll bring it up higher. And something starts to happen in here. The system begins to stabilize. And if we take the karma up too high, you get very, very small changes. But mostly the system has kind of stopped doing anything. On the other hand, if we bring the karma down, the system gets more dynamic. It starts doing more and more stuff. But if we bring the karma down very close to zero, so now effects are very localized, something interesting happens. What we notice is that the system gets this collection of jagged lines. And we lose this sort of high-level system behavior. <coughs> and instead, it's as if every element is kind of acting for itself without cooperating with the other elements. And we get this sort of like almost chaotic-looking output. 
So you scratch your heads and you talk about the meaning of karma and how it affects society's productivity and things like that for a few weeks. And you go on. So this was a process throughout summer, two summers ago, was basically experimenting with the system, doing different kinds of experiments on it to try to understand how this thing behaves. Okay, and then came an idea, which was to use what's called a genetic approach to training the system to do certain things. So what's a genetic approach? Basically, take a hundred of these systems with random initial chemical setups. Don't know what any of them are going to do, but ask them to do some task. I want you to add two numbers together and come up with a way to code your numbers in terms of chemicals. Take this random population of 100 systems, see which ones do the best job of adding two numbers. None of them are going to know how to add, right? Because they're just random. But take the ones that get closest to the answer, okay? And then somehow pick the top, you know, five systems that look like they're doing something almost like adding, combine them, okay? Come up with a new population that combines the characteristics of these systems kill off the ones that didn't do well, throw in some mutation, take the new population, repeat the process. Okay, this is an evolutionary algorithm, um, genetic approach. Genetic algorithms go back to the 60s. This has been used for a lot of different areas. So applying a GA to the exist system to see if we could start teaching the system, coaxing it towards, um, towards some kind of useful behavior. All right, so now we start running experiments on the system's capabilities. So the first experiment was logic gates. Logic gates are the building blocks of computers. Things like an AND gate. So an AND gate says, tell me if this is true and that is true. An OR gate says, tell me if this is true or that is true. And if you have a few logic gates, turns out you only need two of them, you can build a computer. Okay, that's what we do in, in some of the computer science classes, Engineering 250, for example. So started trying to evolve an exist system that could do basic logic operations. And guess what, it worked. Okay, now it took a few months of trial and error. There were some bugs in the simulation that had to be chased down. Um, had to do some different tweaks on it. And eventually, one of the keys turned out to be, if we think of these transfers taking place, this instruction says transfer from location two to 10, we introduced a bias, which was fixed. And it said, you know, whatever transfer this says, add a certain amount to the source and the destination. So if this says go from two to 10, it actually means go from three to 20. Right? And that set of biases became basically the genome for each system. That's the <coughs> thing that we made it and combined to get new generations. And once we introduced the bias, this thing just started evolving really quickly. And it made perfect AND gates, OR gates, XOR gates. So we can implement logic gates using exist. Don't know how it works, right? But we can feed in the inputs, run the system, and out comes the correct output. Okay, so where do we go after logic gates? What's the next logical step in developing a computing system? Let's play tic-tac-toe, right? Obviously. So, um, so there's exist, the usual display, the sideways uh, time display. And here's a series of games being played. So the setup was there were certain regions in here that represented moves that the opponent wanted to make. And if the opponent wanted to move in a certain square, you would inject chemicals into that corresponding region. That's how you told exist what the user's move was. And then a moderator monitored certain output regions, and the first region that saturated with chemicals, that was the, the exist system's move. And the moderator would play the game. It would get the, the user's move, and then it would get the move from exist, and it would do this until the game was over. And so you're seeing you know, hundreds of games being played in rapid succession here, and for each game, there was a score given to decide how good a job exist was doing. And so this ran for a few weeks, and we just kind of let it chow on game after game after game. And the systems that won more games than the others, they got to pass on their genetic structure, their biases, um, to create a new population. And so here's what happened after a few weeks of this. Um, it definitely played much better than a random player, okay? It could win about 90% of the games that you played with it. But the decision of how to train it was really kind of an, an issue. For example, if you train the system against an expert player, somebody who really knows how to play tic-tac-toe, right, it can win most of the time against that expert, except when a draw is forced. But if it plays someone who doesn't know how to tic-tac-toe, how to play tic-tac-toe, that person might win. Because if you have an opportunity to make a winning move and you don't take it, 
or to block exist when it's about to win, it would trip it up. Because playing an expert, it had never seen those scenarios. So then we tried training against a random opponent. Well, it could beat a random opponent 90% of the time, but never beat an expert, right? Because random opponents, there's a lot of <coughs> random games you can play, and 90% is a pretty good score, but it's 0% against someone who knows what they're doing. So then we try to figure out what a typical opponent is, and also how do you score? Because winning is not the same as not losing, right? Some games are going to be a draw. If you know what you're doing, you can always force a draw on tic-tac-toe. So if you say you've got to win every game, you're penalizing a perfect player just because sometimes you have to have a draw. And if you say drawing is good, then it might give up opportunities to win, right? So this got really complicated, and eventually it felt like instead of studying exist, I was studying tic-tac-toe, <laughs> right? I'm trying to figure out how to teach someone to tic-tac-toe. So, um, so I, I changed gears at that point, and I went on to the Lunar Lander Project. So um, this was a great arcade game in the 70s, right? It was a vector graphics black and white game. There's a ship coming down to the moon, and you can turn it and you can control the thrust. And your goal is to land on the surface at as low a speed as possible and not to run out of fuel. Because once you burn all your fuel, you just free fall, OK? So <coughs> wired up a version of Exist. Um, and it had a server up here, which was simulating the actual falling of this ship. And the little red on the bottom means the thrust is on. And when it's not there, the thrust is off. And a system that was monitoring this, the initial height, how much fuel was left, how quickly it was falling. And same thing, there's regions here that you inject to feed that information into the system. And there's an output region. And when it's got more than a certain amount of chemicals, it means turn the thrust on. And started training this. So ship after ship after ship, descending, crashing, maybe not crashing and scoring how well the <coughs> system is doing at controlling the ship. And after, I don't know how many days of experiments, here's what happened, more success, okay? We were able to develop an exist system that could successfully land this ship below the crash velocity, but it was very sensitive to initial conditions. If you started two meters higher or lower, the ship would just crash into the surface, right? Or if you change slightly more or less fuel in the beginning, right? So then we retrain with a variation in these initial conditions. Run your tests from this altitude and some altitudes above and below and different amounts of fuel, and we got a more stable solution. And we came up with an exist system that could successfully land this ship under a whole range of different conditions. But even before we got this project going, my brain was already on the next task. Okay, this was really a preamble to the next task. It was a setup because we had this, this um, server system up here, this separate process running, telling us how the ship was acting. And that was a lead into the next task, which was the virtual ecosystem. So this was inspired by a former student, Jordan Curry, um, for his year-long service learning project. He developed this virtual world. And it had these little organisms that would move around, and they'd eat food, and they'd expend energy, and they'd interact with one another. And when I saw his project, I was like, this is like really cool, right? And I had this feeling it was going to come back in some form sooner or later. So it came back as sort of the ultimate test bed for Exist. And the idea was build this virtual environment with small organisms. They move around, they eat food, they expend energy, they can mate with one another, and when they mate, their genomes get combined and a new creature appears with that combined genome. And if they run out of energy, they die, and they can attack each other and have each of these organisms controlled by a separate instance of exist. And this is nice because it's the ultimate genetic algorithm. What's the survival metric survival, right? The ones that live long enough to mate are doing a good enough job that their genomes get passed on. And the ones that aren't very successful at surviving, they die and their genome dies with them. So this felt like a very kind of non-artificial version of a genetic algorithm, whereas the lunar lander was kind of, you know, a little quirky. So um, put together an ecosystem, and these are the organisms. So they're, um, they have eyes just to tell you which way they're facing. And at any point in time, they can move forward, they can turn left or turn right, or they can stay still. The green dots are food, and if they encounter a green dot, their energy level goes up. Every time they move, their energy level goes down. If their energy reaches zero, they die. If an organism comes up beside another organism, for example, I don't know if there's one in here. Um, for example, this organism is facing this one. It's attacking it, and it's pulling energy from it. Okay, And once the energy goes to zero, the creature dies. So they pull energy from each other. 
if two organisms come face to face, they mate. Okay, rather than pulling energy from each other, they create an offspring, and the genome of that offspring is a combination of the genome of the two organisms that met. <coughs> so, ran this simulation, um, there's an ID on top of each of these, and there's a energy level number below that's hard to read, but the energy level is color-coded. Bright red is lots of energy, darker is less energy. If you get too dark, your energy will eventually go to zero, and you disappear, and you're gone. Um, so put this together, and this was fun to watch. It was a nice screensaver, put some techno in the background, uploaded some videos, and um, just started, started experimenting with it, right? So one experiment was throwing a bunch of food, right? Not a lot of organisms. And this creature up here is just running in circles. Give me food, give me food, give me food, right? And eventually food appears, and it survives. And this one's got an even shorter path. It's just going back and forth, and food will appear eventually, because I was loading a lot of food in here. But what caught my eye was this creature up here. And this creature mostly stays still until food appears, and then it goes around and gobbles it up and it sits there. And it sits here, and then when food appears, it'll go around and gobble it up, and then it'll hang out. And that was interesting. That was not just running in a circle like this and you happen to encounter some food. This is actually, the effect is it conserves its energy until there's a reason to move. Now it's random, it doesn't know that's what it's doing, but it was intriguing to me that this system of chemicals interacting with one another with karma and all this stuff could somehow be exhibiting this behavior. All right, so we stare at this, and, and I also introduced a daytime nighttime cycle, so sometimes this will start to get dark, and it's one other input to these systems, and it'll, it takes care of the issue of sometimes these creatures just sit around and they don't do anything, and eventually they got eaten, so sometimes the background gets darker and lighter. Okay, so here's something that I noticed while this was running after a few days, um, these ID numbers continue to increase, and that makes sense. What's the typical life experience of one of these creatures? Well, you stay still, and you're like a blob of food. You're gonna get attacked, you're gonna die. Or you move around, and there's not a lot of food, so you're probably gonna run out of energy, and you're gonna die. Okay, so that's sort of the ultimate end game for these creatures. Um, and once you die, your number is gone, but if you manage to mate, a new creature appeared and it has whatever the next sequential ID is. So as more and more creatures appear, right, the ID numbers began to increase. <coughs> and right now they're all, you know, basically below 100, but after several hours they might all be around 500. And you come back the next day, they might all be around 3,000. That was expected. What I didn't expect, though, was that even in that case where all the ID numbers were around 3,000, there'd be one or two creatures with a really low ID. These were very old creatures. When I first did this, there was one creature, I think it was number 17, and it was still in there from the first generation, even though most of the other creatures were several thousand generations old. So that's interesting. So what's going on with these older creatures? Are they just lucky, or do they somehow have some survival mechanisms? So more experiments. So one thing I did, I made a way to take over one of these creatures. You could pick a creature, and instead of being controlled by exist, I could control it with my keyboard. And now I'd run it around, and I'd go over to this really old creature, and I'd come up to the side and poke it and see what it does. And I'd come up in front of it and run away and see if it chases me. I could interact with it, right? Um, so played around with that. So. At that point, the idea was basically these creatures are more or less random, but every now and then a creature emerges, emerges that seems to have a survival capability. Okay? But after enough time, all of the creatures seem to be old. And occasionally a creature would die and a new one would appear, but the bulk of the population was all very old, right? thousands of cycles old. So what happened? Were those creatures really exceptional, or had they simply stopped competing with one another, or what was going on here? So it came up with a new experiment. And here was the idea. Ran the system for six million cycles. Got a very old population. Made a completely new population of 50 random individuals. 25 of them I color-coded red. The other 25 I color-coded blue, but I took out their DNA and I injected the DNA from these old individuals. And then I let them just interact with each other. So we've got a population of red individuals that are completely random, population of blue individuals that have been around for six million cycles, or a good part of six million cycles. 
and it looked like this. Okay, so the blue ones are the very old ones, the red ones are the very young ones. And at first, you know, they're just kind of moving around, interacting. I didn't put a whole lot of food in, right? We control how frequently food appears. So not a whole lot of food. Um, and they go around, they interact, and we'll speed up this <coughs> simulation. We'll jump forward a few minutes shortly. And as we start watching what happens, it started to look like, there's a nighttime cycle, it started to look like the red creatures were disappearing more quickly than the blue ones. And I turned off mating here, because I just wanted these two populations totally, um, totally independent of each other, so no mating. Um, and the red population started to go down. And the blue population mostly persisted. So it's running, it's printing out information every time there's a birth, a death, all this kind of stuff. And I go back and crunch it, and here was the result. After six million cycles, the blue population uh, was injected. Seven red creatures died before the first blue creature. And 14 red deaths occurred after only two blue deaths. So it was about a 7x survival edge for this whole population. And these things don't know what they're doing. I'm not claiming that they're like, you know, smart or they're learning anything. But this system of chemicals, this exist system, seemed to be able to learn and apply something that gave a definite survival advantage to, to this older population. So that was kind of interesting, and that brought us up towards the end of summer. Um, this was last summer now. And so at that point, I went off and I wrote a book. So we've got, we've got two copies left up here, if you're interested. Um, and this book covers the whole story. It starts from the cell matrix, okay, the system back in the mid 80s. And it also talks about something called the Songline Processor. That was one attempt at continuity, and then it takes you up through Exist. And it describes all the details of these experiments, all the, the inputs and outputs and the initial <coughs> settings and so on and so forth. It's all in there, um, along with references, um, pointers to the code and so on. All this stuff, by the way, is public domain, okay? I, I went um, Creative Commons open source years ago. All the stuff is freely available. I'll give you a link to the main website at the end. And you can download this book for free. There's a Kindle edition you can download for free. You can buy it on Amazon if you want a, a nice uh, hard copy. And I think I make seven cents on each copy. Um, so, so there's that book. So I, I spent some time writing that. And I finished that up um, last fall. And then um, went on to the next set of experiments. So, um, and this will be a really brief section. But I started with Kaggle.com. That's basically a platform that you can do data science on. And it's organized around the idea of competitions. And um, basically, they give you a set of data, and you're trying to train a system to use that data to make some prediction. So they'll give you a set of data and the matching predictions. You train your system, and once you think you're good to go, they'll send you another set of data without the predictions. Your system makes the predictions. You send them in. They send you back a score. Okay. And some of this is just for fun and education. Some of this has cash prizes available. Okay. There's like a real estate competition from Zillow, I think. And they're trying to predict market prices or something. So the Hello World is Titanic survival data. Okay, they have a database of passengers from the Titanic, name, uh, age, male or female, port of departure, price of the ticket, all this information on them, and did they survive or die? So I was like, okay, let's see if Exist can predict Titanic survival. Well, the first thing it did was it came up with the conclusion, if you're female, you survive, if you're male, you die. <laughs> and guess what? That's a really accurate prediction. Because women and children got life rafts, right? And the majority of women survived, and the majority of men did not. So I was like, okay, we'll just take sex out of it, and we'll train it on the other parameters. Well, now, at the end of it, several days of running, <coughs> with, with the prediction, you're going to die. Right? <laughs> and that's also very accurate, because most people died. Okay, so this started to feel like, like the tic-tac-toe problem, right? Where I was trying to figure out how to train the system instead of see what Exist could do. And I was kind of getting bored with this anyway, but I sort of took a break, and there were several months gap in here. And then a few months ago, started on the next step, which was a two-dimensional version of Exist. Because we see the world through this two-dimensional lens, right, at least. And Exist is really one-dimensional. It's a big line of these tubes. So two-dimensional version of Exist. So same mechanics as before, but now you need an X and a Y coordinate to address <coughs> source and destination. So we got four chemicals, 2D locations of these chemical tubes, karma is a 2D effect, the genome is 2D, right? Everything not just doubles, but goes N squared now. And guess what? This was really, really slow. 
Okay? Because if you want 10 times as many tubes, now you've got to do 100 times as much computation. And this was a deal breaker, right? Because typically you have to run you know, 40, 50 generations to tell what's happening with a particular algorithm. And this was taking a day for one generation. And my patience just didn't last that long. So I'd write the code and I'd get it and I'd say run and I'd look at it and I'd look at it and about an hour later I'd be like, okay, forget that, you know, and I'd try something different. And I wasn't getting any results because I didn't have the patience to let the system run. So I started thinking about, um, you know, making a Raspberry Pi cluster in my closet. And I started pricing out Raspberry Pi, these little portable computers. And I was gonna get like 40 or 50 of them and make a little supercomputer at home and things like that. And um, Summertime is when good things happen in my life lately. So, um, so news of this got back to my advisor at Virginia Tech and I got an email at the end of July and it said, let me know if you need more remote compute power. I have some idle high-end machines in the lab. Might as well make use of them. So I dropped him a note back and we started talking. Well, he had what's called an Intel Xeon processor. It's a 28 core machine. A core is like an individual CPU, right? So basically I had 28 little computers inside. Two to, four, two to four gigahertz, right, pretty fast speed. And it has an FPGA on board. Now, I'm not using that, but it's customizable hardware, mm -hmm. right, right on the same platform. Um, so Q4, they're coming out with the next version of this. This is what it's going to look like. That's a cool looking machine, what? right? It's got a tube with liquid in it. What else do you need to know, right? <laughs> so, so, so this thing's awesome, right? Um, so how do we utilize that? Well, let's say our population is 50 individuals and we're doing this genetic approach, right? If we have 25 cores, we can take 25 individuals, farm each one to its own core, let it do the simulation, right? And then take the next 25, farm them out, have one process on the 26th core that collects all of this information and then figures out who the best members are, does the mating, the death, the mutation, comes up with a new population, farms it out. And I left two cores for Peter and a friend to play with. So, um, and this is pure 25x speed up, right? Highly parallelizable. So what I used to take an entire day of CPU time to do, which was one generation, I could do in less than an hour. So I could evolve 25 generations a day, 50 generations in two days, that was, that was doable. So I was back on the air and I could do some experiments. So I tried evolving logic gates and I got <clears throat> about seven out of eight of my tests to work. Couldn't get perfection. But I decided, I don't care, I'm not really interested in logic gates. Let's do some image processing. So that's why I wanted a 2D version, because images are 2D. So here was the idea. This is our 2D version of exist. And all of these are you know, little tubes of chemicals. And an image is what? It's a bunch of pixels, and each pixel has a certain intensity. And I was going to code that intensity as an amount of chemical in each of these tubes. So I'd basically load the image into this part of the system. I'd run the system, let all the transfers take place, and I'd monitor three output regions. And whichever region got saturated with chemicals first, that's what Exist claimed the image was. I wanted to see if I could recognize things. So uh, Yale Face Database has 15 subjects, 11 poses each. Straight on, smiling, frowning, glasses, no glasses, left light, and so on and so forth. And so I picked out, um, a random face from the database and loaded it in and so the purple map of exists looks like an image, right? And this is sped up 10 times because it's pretty slow. But slowly, you know, these chemicals are moving around, they're being drained from here and this output region is starting to get chemicals to appear in it. And did this one night, like really late at night and it started to look like a mix between Spock and Yoda. <laughs> that was kind of weird. So, don't know what it's doing, but, um, but it's doing something, right? So here's 100x speed up, and you just kind of see how it's kind of digesting this information and turning it into output. So use this with a genetic approach, try to train it over, over multiple runs. And here's the result. So I trained it on three subjects, five poses each. And it only scored 200. It should have scored 300, that would be perfect. It only scored 200, but when I looked at the details, it was doing perfect on two of the subjects, and then not at all on, on the third. So two subjects in five different poses each, and it could tell me this is subject one, this is subject two, whether they had glasses on, whether they were smiling or not smiling, and so on. So while well, is that third subject necessary? I don't know, so I tried two subjects, five poses, and it basically got perfect. It was missing one, one data point, but 199 out of 200. So then I tried it on five subjects, let it run a lot longer. Um, 60 to 80% success on four of them, 
nothing on five. But if you restrict to two poses, perfect differentiation between four different subjects. So that was kind of interesting. A few days ago, I started on 10 subjects. That's running right now. Um, and it looks like it's basically getting three out of 10. So I don't know what that's, what that's doing. But this is all first experiment in image recognition, right? All right, so um, quick wrap up. Where do we go from here? Um, so the thing you gotta do is after you train your system, you gotta give it data you haven't trained on and see if it can actually recognize. So train it on five poses take five more poses that it's never seen, see if it can still differentiate. Okay, that's sort of the real test. Um, Got to change the genetic structure because it's still based on this 1D setup, so I want to do what's called smoothing it. Um, there's been suggestions for ways to tweak the architecture um, to make it more in line with, with the natural world. Looking for more applications, there's been suggestions for new training approaches. Still the idea of actually explicitly programming it and ultimately an actual hardware implementation. So we're not simulating it on a PC, but we actually have something that's doing these transfers, probably electrons instead of chemicals, but something that actually runs without the discretizations and a lot faster. And that's, that's kind of the, the end goal for the next phase of work. So last slide is um, if you want to know anything more about this, all you need is songlinesystems.com. Okay, that's got links to everything. But some of the links you'll find on there are slash book. That's a link to the electronic versions of the book. Um, I have a Twitter feed. I don't post on it often, but if something exciting starts to happen, I'll start posting on Twitter. Um, whatever job is currently running on the server out of Virginia Tech, um, it pushes out every 10 seconds a status page to this website. Um, and you can see kind of what's going on with the current score is and so on and so forth. And this is just one of the links to the code. So all the code's on GitLab, um, and this is the current set of experiments for the 2D version. But everything on there, plus cell matrix and all of that, is available on Git. Um, or just come and ask me, because if you haven't figured this out, I'm really excited about this stuff, and I love talking about it. <laughs> so you can always just like ding me. Um, so I'll leave that up. Um, that's my last slide, and I'll say thanks for your attention. And we got a few minutes if there's any questions. I would love to do that. I don't have the bandwidth to teach myself CUDA or something like that, a programming language or anything. Yeah. But, um, but that's a killer application for it. And this is pretty much integer stuff for the most part, right? Or very simple loading points. So yeah, GPU would be a great way to do this. And then you've got you know hundreds of cores. Um, so if you're interested in playing with GPUs, talk to me. This could be a cool project. Yeah, I was yeah. looking at uh, how they kind of adapted and some were acting differently from others. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's a little bit like AI? Can yeah, maybe. Um, and I don't want to call this AI because, yeah. like I say, I don't think it's actually, you know, the tic-tac-toe player has no idea how to play yeah. tic-tac-toe, for example. It's just kind of mimicking. Um, but certainly AI was, was in the pool of stuff in 1986 when we started down this path, the idea of self-awareness and self-consciousness and and being able to build on top of knowledge you've already gained to be able to build more quickly in the future. That's definitely in there, and I hope slash believe that it's somewhere in this stuff too. Yeah, that's Yeah, thanks. Yeah? Nick, is this approach in any way similar to the uh, IBM Watson approach? I don't think so. So I think Watson is largely a neural network, and, and there's, Degrees of similarity between everything, I imagine. Um, but but this does not look like anything I've encountered before as far as neural nets, mainly because it's just so dang quirky, right? I mean, it's it's so kind of intertwined with itself. Um, and a neural net is is usually you know input layer, layers in between output layer, and things flow through, and it's fairly straightforward, I think, to understand at least the structure of how information is flowing through there and moving. And this, at least the way that, that I've been working with it, I have no idea what it's doing, right? So that's sort of the reason that I think it's probably pretty different. Um, I've made some attempts to develop a mathematical model for this, and I end up with a bunch of integrals on the board, and I don't know what to make of it. But 
but that's that's one direction to maybe try to understand how this links into other things that are out there. Yeah. So if everything's constantly interacting with itself, then how do you determine how to simulate the order of the propagation? Does that make sense? Everything changes at the same time. So you've got a bunch of chemicals, and each set of chemicals is a transfer instruction. So we analyze all of those, right, one at a time because it's on a PC. But we don't do the transfers. We collect the information about what's going to be transferred in a staging area. And everything gets added together, right? And once you've analyzed all the current sets of chemical levels, now you know what the total effect of that's going to be, and you apply that across all the chemicals. And then you go ahead and you do that again. Okay, but it's basically analyze, figure out the composite change, apply that, and then analyze, figure out the change, apply. <coughs> but effectively, all the things are happening at the same time. And that's a good question because that took a really long time to like figure out. <laughs> Well, I'm excited this, of your virtual ecosystem mm -hmm. because I can s imagine how it will get further on if you, once you get you set a hardware. Yeah, yeah. Get it all. Yeah, yep. just let us know. It'll be the next talk, right? Okay, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speed's the big killer, right? Because yeah. if you've got 100 exist systems and you're trying to model 10,000 sets of chemicals, right? That's 100 times 10,000 things that you're doing one at a time because you're running it on a PC yeah. or 25 at a time if you've got fancy Intel <laughs> processor. But if it's actually like, you know, we've got a hardware system that does this, it's just a huge speed up, and then we can really do some research. And you can have your students help you. Absolutely, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this is all non-commercial, right? So, so seriously, if you're, if you're looking for a service learning project, right, for your year-long project, and you've got some interest in this, right, come and talk to me, because there's lots of work that can be farmed off, and we could do it in a way that whatever the outcome is, right, it would be beneficial to you and your learning as far as, as doing the SLP. So that's always there. What are you programming then? Java. But one of my goals for this quarter is to port it to C++. Because I'm supposed to learn C++ for my tenure thing, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's my goal. Yeah? So do you, when you try to code with me so that you try to do some coding uh, with using the APS, what, so you said you were using Java So, so I'm using Java for the engine underneath for the simulation. But to actually come up with programs, well, I was coming up with these crazy templates that basically listed the tubes across and then time would go down. And I was coming up with basically a way to code information so I could say how much chemical I was going to put here and then figure out by hand what that was going to do at the next level. And then I was starting to see patterns in that. For example, if I want to move a bunch of chemicals from here to there, what kind of instructions do I have to code up? And then I had a simulator that could take my coded version of this information, compile it into chemical levels, and then we could step through it. So it was really just kind of building the building blocks for how to start doing, you know, hello worlds basically on this system. But um, but as soon as I tried to do anything that changed over time, like first I want to move this here, and then I want to move that over there, the interactions just started to get too uh, too complex. Now you can crank the karma down to zero and get rid of that, and you can make your discretization really big, you can make this look like a von Neumann machine, basically, right, but that, that defeats the whole fun of it. So when you keep it in the full form, it's just didn't get very far. But I'm not giving up on that. All right, any other questions, thoughts? No? I'm so happy you guys came. Thank you. Yes, thank you for coming. Thank you.